The rhyme says that April showers bring May flowers, but the experienced forager knows that March rains bring violets. Now that revision doesn't have the same lyrical flow or cheesy following historical joke, but for those hankering for fresh greens after a long cold winter, poetry is found in leaves, not just words. Furthermore, violets are only a spring treat. Once the summer has run its blistering course and acorns start dropping from the oaks, these generous perennials make an encore appearance and give the forager one last harvest of deliciously edible greenery. You may have seen violets as a weed in an unsprayed lawn or as a pleasant sign of spring, but I hope to introduce you to this widespread plant as a valuable source of food as well. Now, no matter where you live, there's a local species of violet to be found. They grow coast to coast, north to south, and in a huge variety of environments, from marshy forests to dry pine glades. Every species of violet is edible, although some certainly are more desirable than others. You'll have to taste and see for yourself which ones you like. Now, violet leaves are so varied, even within species, that botanists themselves are sometimes at odds with each other over which species is which, or if one species actually counts as two separate species. So the best identification feature is the blossom, which thankfully is similar across all species. They are five petaled, but the petals are irregular, with two distinctly paired on top, two to each side, outstretched, and one at the bottom that often has purple streaks. Now, if you squint at it upside down, you can almost see a little person with a big stripy yellow spotted head, two arms, often complete with hairy armpits, and two legs. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'll be focusing mostly on the common blue violet, Viola sororia. It's the easiest to identify, and it very well may be the most widespread. Now, common blue violet grows heart-shaped scallop leaves that extend up from a center root mass and form a dense layer beneath their purple flowers. But you'll also see some images of bird foot violet, Viola pedata. This violet species is abundantly common on my Ozark Hill in the spring, as it's a fan of growing in dry soil near pine trees. The leaves of this species are palmate and so deeply cut that they are nearly fern-like in character. Now, I honestly don't bother with collecting those leaves because the abundant profusion of blossoms above them is far more worth my time. Probably no other violet offers so many blooms all at once, sometimes carpeting the ground in an unbroken blanket of lavender, white, and purple. They're easy to gather by the handful if you're on the hunt for blossoms, but I admit, some springs I just can't bear to ruin that showy display. I guess I'm a sucker for butterflies and honeybees. Now, since there are more than 70 species of violet found in the United States alone, and all of them with incredibly variegated forms within species, it's strange to try to tell you what to look alike with violets. But thankfully, violets are friendly to the forager, because as I said earlier, every species is edible, and their flowers are consistently shaped from species to species. The only problem you might run into is if you're harvesting from unflowering plants. Now, Samuel Thayer points out that there are some species of violet with palmate leaves, which may be confused with the early leaves of larkspur or pre-flowering buttercup, both of which are toxic. If you find that palmate leaved species of violet are common in your area, the best safeguard I can recommend is waiting until they flower to harvest the leaves. Now, violet leaves are a spring delight, offering up some very needed greens after a winter of root vegetables and starch staples. Picking leaves in quantity is surprisingly easy, and as you may find, they're almost a cut and come again wild vegetable. As soon as you get all the tasty greens from one stand, you'll find that the one you harvested last week is already lush and ready to pick again. Now, I commonly use my hands like a violet leaf harvesting comb, working my fingers beneath the leaves, clenching them together, and then twisting to rest those lovely leaves from the stems. In the height of spring, and again, as the fall rains return, you can easily collect leaves by the basket fall. Now there's no worry if you do get some of those stems, by the way. All the aerial parts are edible, even though I find the stems a bit tough later in the season. Now the root mass underground is suspected to be toxic, but it would honestly be foolish to pick it anyway. You'd be killing off future harvests. Now violet leaves are usually pretty clean pickings, although they do have a tendency to collect bits of dirt on their undersides after spring rains. I usually wash mine in several changes of water to just make sure that the grit is kept to a minimum. Now a second product violets offer is their flowers. Despite that lovely appearance, they taste much the same as the leaves, at least as far as the common blue violet is concerned. Some species do have a wintergreen flavor. Now that said, they're a fun nibble in the field, especially for children, who can never seem to get enough of those bright blossoms. And they're so plentiful, there's no harm in letting the kids graze like sheep. You can collect blossoms for use in tea and in medicine, but they require some careful drying. One spring, I painstakingly collected enough flowers to fill a whole mason jar, which is no small undertaking, considering that they shrivel up to a fraction of their original size. Now, I was fairly confident that I had thoroughly dried them before putting them into storage, but when winter came and I wanted to have some bright bur purple tea to remind me of spring, I found that they had transformed into a furry lump of gray mold. To say that I was disappointed is an understatement. So I now store my dried blossoms in the freezer where they're just as easy to access, but there's no chance of my efforts turning into dust. 
Now violet leaves are edible raw, and since they sprout at the same time as chickweed, they can be easily gathered for a fresh green spring salad. For raw eaten, the slightly unfurled leaves that are a lighter green than the rest are the best pickings. Violet leaves are also a good addition to any of your green smoothie recipes. They're sweet and mild, imparting a mild vegetal flavor without a trace of bitterness. When cooked, violet leaves have a mucilaginous quality, and so much though, they're sometimes referred to as wild okra when put in soup. Now I find that they absolutely shine when blended into a green paste and used for a wild version of sag paneer. They retain that brilliant green color, which makes for an eye-catching and delectable presentation. You can find our recipe for wild green sag paneer and more at our earlier video here. Now you'll often find recipes for violet flowers online. Violet jelly, violet salads, candied violets, and violet blossom smoothies. The lovely purpley pigment of violets is water soluble, so inventive cooks have taken advantage of that feature for eye-dazzling culinary effects. Now, despite that lovely appearance, you always need to prepare yourself for the fact that violet blossoms just don't add much flavor. But they do have one fun feature. When brewed into a purple infusion, they change to a bright pink blush if an acid is added. That means you can make a sweet violet blossom tea and then add lemon juice for color-changing pink lemonade. Kids and adults will likely be thrilled and what a way to celebrate spring. Now, as a final note, violet leaves and blossoms brewed into a tea are a traditional throat-soothing remedy for those colds that seem to also emerge alongside those spring flowers. Violets, ever lush, ever available, and a rich reward for those who see them as food, not weeds.